are having uh, we have a, a great presentation planned for you today, and I'm excited. With lectures. Thank you very much. Uh, let me tell you about Professor Kuchaki. She is an associate professor of management and organizations at Kellogg School of Management. She's an organizational psychologist who seeks to make theoretical and practical contributions at the intersection of management and psychology. Uh, she's the editor in chief of the journal Organization Behavior and Human Decision Processes. Her work has appeared in publications, including Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences, uh, other scholarly publications, as well as Harvard Business Review, New York Times, Business Week, Wall Street Journal, The Huffington Post, and the BBC. She has uh, won many awards. She was selected as one of the best 40 professors under the age of 40. Uh, the best empirical conference paper for the International Association of Conflict Management, um, and a whole list of other things. So um, she is highly regarded and an expert in her topic, which is understanding ethical behavior, unethical behavior. Uh, she will speak to us, and at the end of her presentation, I will come back on and uh, moderate questions, uh, which uh, Miriam has been, uh, is gracious and looking forward to answering. So welcome everyone and welcome Professor Kachaki. Um, thank you, Wendy. Thank you for your kind introduction. Hello everyone. I'm very excited to be here. I live here in Evanston with my family, so I care deeply about this community, so I'm very excited to be here. And in this talk, I want to focus on a persistence of unethicality and misconduct and give you an understanding of its psychology. Um, I'm a professor, as Wendy mentioned, I'm a professor in the management and organization department here at Kellogg School of Management, Northwestern University. I've been here at Northwestern uh, for about eight years now. Uh, I'm an organizational psychologist that studied the intersection of management and psychology. I focus on understanding the dynamics of moral decision making, how individuals psychologically experience moral encounters at work. So for today, as I mentioned, I'm going to focus on understanding the persistence of unethicality and um, most of you probably agree with me that we hear about misconduct, you know, a questionable behavior uh, all the time. Um, as you are uh, aware, over the past a couple of decades, mostly uh, two or three decades, numerous cases of corporate corruption and misconduct have had a deep impact um, and really has increased cynicism and distrust of uh, public uh, when it comes to uh, corporations um, and their uh, leaders. In the wake of a, a large number of these scandals from Enron, fall of Enron in, you know, in 1990s to recent scandals in, um, uh, for example, uh, Wells Fargo or even Facebook and others, I think one question we all have is um, why? Why people and organizations do bad things? So my hope is that in this talk, I'll give you a different perspective, uh, you know, a more psychological perspective of why individuals engage in repeated dishonest behavior. So let me first start with um, what we know or how people talk about misconduct and unethicality um, when it comes to, to research. So one dominant perspective view that most um, academics talk about is this idea that maybe unethical behavior is really a matter of a few bad apples. This is um, that there are people that are bad. So it's a dispositional argument that there, there are few people that are bad and they are responsible for a large number of, you know, the misconduct and bad behavior that we, that we are exposed to with what we see around us. So in this case, the argument is that a few bad apples, a few opportunistic people, greedy individuals and organization, they are responsible and organizations really don't have much of a control. They have little influence on the, these people's behavior. For example, Enron is a good example of this. If you 
have read anything about Enron, follow the news. There, were, there was this case where there were a couple of people really at top of that organization that were very opportunistic and sleazy, and those were very much responsible with what happened. So we have heard of a lot of stories about Enron and the bad people at the very top of this organization. Another perspective is that maybe it's not really a few bad people, rather than the blame is for unethical behavior with organization really having an unethical culture. So basically, in this case, the idea is that organizations and the culture they create, it promotes a mindset and a practice that people are encouraged to do anything necessary to ensure business succeed. And for that reason, this mindset and this culture is the reason why people are doing bad things. And in fact, there are again many examples of you know this when you know we can think of other different examples when we think about this phenomenon. We can think of, for example, Wells Fargo would be a case where um, what we heard in the news is that a couple of managers um, obviously they put aggressive goals, they set up aggressive goals, but there were a lot of employees that they were encouraged because they wanted to achieve these goals. They basically engage in questionable behavior, they created all these fake accounts. So the idea here is that this manager created a culture of um, you know, unethicality and corruption and individuals, they like fell for it. So they basically, beca they became part of this culture and then they engage in questionable behavior. Obviously, when you think about each of these perspectives, a few bad apples or really this idea of bad barrel and really bad business practices, there is some truth, meaning that we can't really say one is really like what's happening. So rather than it's a mix of different factors. So I want to give you an alternative perspective. But before that, let me start with more of a simplified model. So when we think about and a standard econ perspective here. In an standard econ perspective, the idea is that um, there, like decisions when they involve questionable behavior on ethical behavior, they are very deliberate and conscious, meaning that they assume most of economists, they assume people sit down and then what they do is that they really rationally decide whether they are gonna do something bad you know, something unethical or not. And often when they are thinking about making these decisions, there are a few considerations for them. One of them is, what are the benefits if I engage in this questionable behavior? And if benefits outweigh the cost, obviously, then they, they may go ahead and, uh, you know, do something questionable. They may cheat and lie and, uh, you know, deceive. Another consideration for individual when they are thinking about uh, basically ethical decisions is that what's the probability of being caught, correct? If the probability is very high, again, people are less likely to engage in questionable behavior. And lastly, assuming that I do something questionable and I'm caught, what are basically, what's the magnitude of the punishment? So my point here is that in a more econ perspective, they are really focusing, the, the argument is that people rationally sit down and consciously make this decision and they really outweigh the options they have and the benefits and uh, the costs and benefits of these options as well as the probability of being caught and the magnitude of punishment and this is really essential in their decision. My argument here is that yes, that, that is part of the picture, but when we think about people and the way they make these decisions, we know there is a lot of evidence that shows that people deeply care about ethicality. They want to be ethical people. And this is an evolutionary argument as well for us, for humans as social beings. We care about being ethical and being seen by other people in our group as ethical. So it has a very deep Basically, um, when you think about our psychology, deep roots, this idea that ethicality is essential to who we are and we care deeply about it. So people, 
value honesty. So let me actually share some data with you. So um, there was this survey uh, done in, um, I think it's, it was close to 2000. So it was a US news um, and world report survey. They asked about 1000 Americans to rate whether they and various celebrities are lucky to go to heaven. So the question is like, for example, they asked whether you think Bill Clinton, Michael Jordan, Mother Teresa, yourself, whether you are going to heaven. And here the expectation is that obviously there are some people that are, you know, that, that you know, have higher moral character here on this list. And you would like, you would expect that like people are assuming that there are other people that there is a like, higher likelihood that they would go to heaven. But what that data shows is that in fact, that's not the case. Oh, sorry, I think my slides. Okay, so that's not the case. Rather, when you ask people this question, you see that, of like for example, Bill Clinton is about 50% of people, Mother Teresa, like close to 80. But when you ask people, how, what's the likelihood that you personally go to heaven? About 80% of people say me. Again, this is evidence really showing that we deep care, we care, deeply care about being ethical and we want to be seen as ethical. But at the same time, we know that people engage in questionable behavior, correct? You see cheating a little bit here or there. And, you know, and there are many examples. For example, when you think about uh, fraud, you see insurance fraud, wardrobing. This is the idea that people go and buy clothes, then they wear them and then they go and return it again. It's a questionable uh, practice. You know, there is a lot of basically a tip when it comes to intellectual uh, property and copyright and, uh, and the list is long. So we see a lot of cases where people are cheating a little bit. And even though we know that they deeply care about being um, ethical. So- Miriam, Miriam, yes. excuse me. Could you just slow down a little bit? <laughs> yes, please? I'll try. Thank you. Yes, I told Wendy earlier that, you know, I, I talk about these issues daily. I teach MBA students and doctoral students. So I'm going to try to slow down. And I even have a note here to slow down. Um, but remind me again if you feel like I should just go slower. OK, I'll try. OK, let me give you a different explanation. So when we think about, um, you know, cases of misconduct and uh, deceptive behavior, you know, cheating and lying and dishonesty, what my point of view is that um, when we think about ourselves, correct, our moral self-concept, whether we see ourselves as ethical people, there are a lot of different factors that are playing a role. It's not just what are the benefits and the cost? What's the probability of being caught and what's the punishment? There are a lot more other factors that are in play when it comes to us really seeing ourselves as ethical and then we engage in you know, ethical decision-making. And my point here is that I want to show you some of these um, you know, factors that impact our ethicality, our choices of being honest or dishonest. And hopefully it let you see, the, the, you know, these factors would let you see that it's a complex basically phenomenon, that there are a lot of different factors that are contributing to our ethical decisions. So I want to acknowledge that there are psychological, social factors that impact our ethicality at any moment in time. So let me give you examples of that. For example, this is an example of a type of task that I would use in my research. In my research, um, we used to bring people in lab, physically to the lab. Um, I do a studies online as well when people, um, you know, they uh, agree to participate in a research study and then we give them different tasks and then, uh, you know, they make decisions. So uh, let's assume this is uh, an example from where we were in person and actually people came in uh, to the lab. So imagine that you are given a matrix like that. This is a performance task. So in this matrix task, in this sheet, there are 20 different matrices. It's three by four. So basically there are 12 numbers here. And the task in this example is that we ask people for each of these individual matrices, find the two numbers that add up exactly to 10. 
For example, in this case, if you look at these two numbers, they add up exactly to 10. And we tell our participants, people who come in, our respondents, that for any one of these matrices, if they are able to identify the two numbers that they add up to 10, then they will earn 50 cents or a dollar. So basically, we are really you know, putting incentives in so people are uh, you know, performing better. Now, um, imagine again, you come to the lab, I give you this matrix and with the real money, so you could actually identify the two numbers and you would earn money. And then I ask you to report the total number of matrices that you solved so that we can pay you accordingly. In one version of this task, imagine when you come to the lab, then there is a research assistant, there is an experimenter somewhere in the lab that after you are done, you know, we give you five minutes, for example, to complete these matrices. After five minutes, you will report how many matrices you think you solve, you then give your sheet, the matrices, as well as your uh, basically report of how many you saw to an experimenter, to a person in the lab. And then what they will do is that they will score your performance. They'll check to see how many you were able to correctly identify, and then they will pay you based on that. In our studies, what we find is that on average, people are able to complete six of these matrices, the number you see here. So when we in, put incentives in, we ask people to complete this task, it's like about six, the number that people could complete in five minutes. Now, imagine that you come to the lab, this time, instead of me asking you to um, identify the numbers and give it to an experimenter, to a, to a staff member to score your um, you know, performance, I ask you to self-score. So basically what you do is that you come to the lab, you have money in, a, in an envelope, you complete this task, you report how many matrices you solved correctly, you pay yourself, and then you go ahead and shred your matrices, your response. As you see here in this case, basically there, there, no one checks your work. So now the question is what do you think would happen, correct? And what we actually see is that no surprises, obviously, in this case, there is a chance for people to, to lie, correct? To, to really misreport, um, overreport their performance and earn more money. So, what we see in our studies is that on average, people now say, I have completed 12 matrices and they are paid about five to six dollars. So, we see an increase, and basically, um, um, you see that people are, um, you know, lying now uh, when when they are rewarded. So in this case, obviously, the, the matrices, like in, in whether it's a control condition when when the experimenter is is scoring versus when you are self scoring, everything is identical. Correct. It's the same set of matrices. The only difference is that in one condition, there is an opportunity for people to lie to earn more money. And in the other condition, there is no opportunity. So basically, these two conditions, these, this study provide, uh, provides empirical support uh, that people are likely to, to, to cheat. However, as you see, the number is about 10 or 12. It's not the case that now, because you have the chance to really go ahead and shred your responses and there is no evidence of whether you cheated or not, everyone is really lying to earn, you know, earn $10 you know, to the maximum amount. You will still see that the level of cheating or deception is just a little bit. People are over-reporting a few matrices in this case. Now, let's think about a different condition, different example. In this condition, what I did was that Basically, people came in again to the lab and they were given these matrices to complete. However, when they were in the room completing this task with other people in the room, we had um, a research assistant that was playing a role in that condition and participants in our study didn't know that this is a research assistant, correct? So we paid this person, we told this person as an actor, as a research assistant, 
after a like few seconds, after a minute, you should raise your hand and you just say, you know, this is the script we gave them. We told them after a minute, you stand up and you say, I've solved everything, what should I do? So basically, if you are part of this study, you clearly understand that this person is cheating, correct? There is no way that someone within a minute is able to complete all 12, of, uh, sorry, all 20 of these matrices. So this is a case where we are exposing people to a cheater. They see that another member of their group is cheating. What do you think would happen now, correct? And we use, we do this in two different ways. And for half of the people in our study, the person who stands up is an in-group member, meaning that it's another student from Northwestern. So they are wearing a T-shirt of Northwestern University. For the other half of our participant, the person who is standing up is wearing a T-shirt of University of Chicago. So basically an out-group member. So what we see in this study is that now that there is a cheater in your group, People in the shredder condition when they could cheat, when it's an in-group member, they are now more likely to over-report. Now the average is close to 14 and 15. So you see that now people are more likely to lie when they see that another member of their group is cheating. So the idea here is that now you feel like, oh, it's more normative. It's okay. Another member of my group is cheating. You see that they are more likely to cheat. However, what happens when that person is wearing a different school's t-shirt? What do we see that now in this case, people are less likely to cheat. And the idea here is that now that you see a University of Chicago student is cheating and I'm a, a student in Northwestern, you want to differentiate yourself from a cheater. You don't want to really look like a cheater because this cheater is from a different school. So now you see that people are less likely to cheat. Of course, they still cheat a little bit, correct? The difference is like you see a difference compared to when there is no opportunity to cheat. But importantly, what we see is that people are less likely to cheat compared to when there is a cheater from their own group and compared to when there is no cheater. So I think this is again, providing evidence showing that the, what happens around us, other people in our group, they have an impact on what, how we see our, um, you know, situa the situation we are in, and it influences the psychology of the situation and it changes whether people cheat or not. Now I want to transition to give you a different example. In the studies I showed you right now, there was a shredder condition meaning that basically um, you go ahead, you complete your matrices, then you shred your responses, which means that we don't really know who cheated and how much. We don't know if there were only 10% that cheated to the maximum amount or no. The idea is that most people cheated, but they cheated a little bit, correct? Because the workbook, the matrices were shredded. We have no idea who cheated and you know, uh, uh, to what degree they cheated. So now I'm gonna introduce a different condition. This time, when people come in the lab, they get the matrices, they report how many they completed. Instead of shredding, I just tell them, okay, you take the money and leave, and then please recycle your workbook, you know, your sheet of matrices. So this time, obviously, I could now go ahead and get these matrices, correct, from the recycle bin and then go ahead and score them to see whether how much people cheated, correct? Whether everyone cheated a little bit or there were few people that cheated to the maximum amount. Because so far the numbers I've shown you, these all have been really the average number of matrices people are reporting, correct? So what do we see? Very similar. So they, we don't really find any difference between whether people are recycling or whether they are shredding their matrices. You see that like it's the same number, it's about 10 to 11 matrices on average. However, because now we could actually look at their actual performance, how many they were correctly identifying, what our data shows is that 
it's a large number of people that are cheating and being dishonest, but a little bit. So everyone is really bumping their performance for about, I don't know, three or four matrices. And they are really getting, I don't know, for example, $2 more rather than few people are like really reporting $10 and getting $10. So again, this is important. So once again, this is really showing that when you think about it psychologically, it's more about like in depending on the condition people are you know depending on the condition people are in they are just cheating a little bit more because they have a different psychological experience so let me now um talk about a different condition so again my point here is that there are a number of different psychological uh, conditions that could lead people to engage in more or less dishonest behavior in the prior study, what I showed you was an, an example in which people um, were exposed to another cheater, whether that person was part of their in-group, another student in their university, or that person was from a different group, a rival group, correct? So again, out-group versus in-group. Now, let me show you another example, another research project that I've done. In this study, we are focusing on anxiety. Does anxiety lead to more or less cheating? And I think this is quite important because when you think about organizations, we see that a lot in a lot of organizations, there is a lot of stress. There is a lot of pressure for performance and other things, correct? And the point here is that, is it the case that the anxiety people feel because of the pressure they have in, in their organization, would that induce, would that induce dishonest behavior? Would that lead to more or less dishonest behavior? So in this study, what we did was that we brought people back to the lab. This time, instead of just completing the task on their own, we gave people a headphone. And this time we were really asking them to listen to music from a video, from a movie that was really, um, you know, um, uh, it was a scene about like the person being anxious and hearing really a music that was really um, producing anxiety. So they were completing, listening to this music, you know, this um, anxiety inducing music while completing the performance task and reporting how many they completed. In the other condition, in the control condition, neutral condition, people just were, they were just listening to a neutral music. It was just a neutral uh, filler music that we, 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 um, we were um, using. So the question is what would happen now, correct? What our data shows is that once again, if there is a you know, control condition, when there is um, no nothing really just um, the music is there but people have uh, they, there is no opportunity for cheating obviously you see that people's performance doesn't really change however when they have a chance and they recycle again you see more cheating but more importantly when they have a chance to cheat and lie and you know and get more money but they are listening to an anxiety inducing music they are more likely to actually lie so this provides evidence that when you randomize people, they either are doing you know, a task that they recycle, either with a neutral music versus a music that's anxiety inducing. Under anxiety, when they're psychologically experiencing anxiety, they are more likely to lie and uh, to earn more money. I want to show the same effect with a different type of task. So far, we have only focused on a basic a metric task. It's a performance task. And you would imagine maybe people are just, I don't know, there is something about these metrics task that is uh, you know, um, driving uh, this dishonest behavior. So now we switch to a different type of task. Here, imagine you come to the lab. And in this study, we asked participants, our participants, to identify which side of the diagonal right or left contains more dots by clicking on the bottom labeled more on left or more on right. So basically you look at an image, there are more dots either in left or right, and you are simply asked which side of this you know, diagonal has more, more dots. However, as you see here on the picture is that if you click on there are more dots on the right, your pay is 10 times more than left. <clears throat> so basically, there is 
incentive here to lie and say that there are more dots on the right, correct? Because if you click on the right, you, are, you earn more money. So in this study, we gave people about 100 of these trials. But one thing we did was that among these 100 trials, there were different types of trials. There were 16 of these trials that we call right trials, where in fact, there were more uh, dots on the right side. So when you press on the right and you say there are more dots on the right, you are actually honest and you are being, being paid more for being honest. However, there were about 34 of these trials, what we call left trials, that there were clearly more dots on the left side. So in these trials, left trials, if you go ahead and say there are more on the right, you are lying. If you say there are more on the left, you are being paid less, but you are being honest. And then there were half of these trials, about 50 of them, that it was very ambiguous. You know, there were usually more dots on the right, but it was really hard to identify which side has more dots. And these are more ambiguous trials. We call them um, you know, ambiguous trials. What we did was that, again, people came to the lab. They were randomly assigned to either listen to a neutral music clip, or they were randomized to hear um, to, to listen to an anxiety-inducing music clip. So they came to the lab. What we show is that, when there is left trials, here, remember, ref, left trials are the ones that if you say there are more dots on the right, you are going to really be paid more, but you are actually lying. We see similar to the metrics task that when people are under anxiety inducing music, they are anxious, they report more anxiety, they are more likely to lie. So they are really among these trials they report a higher number of right trials. Similar when you look at ambiguous trials, correct? On ambiguous trials, it's very hard to know which side has more dots. You see a very similar pattern that when people are anxious, they are more likely to say there is more, dot on the, uh, more dots on the right side and they are being paid more. But now the question is maybe anxiety is just leading people to just um, make mistakes, correct? It's not really people being dishonest, rather than it's just a mistake because they are anxious. You're just like, uh, you know, th these are all errors. However, remember we had uh, 16 trials where if you click on the right side, you earn more money and you basically are, uh, you know, um, you, know you, 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 you are paid based on honesty. And in those trials, we see no difference. So which means that, People are not just making mistakes. They are way more, in a sense, intentional. They are just lying or psychologically, it's more likely for them to lie when they are anxious compared to when they are on, in, in a neutral um, a state. But let's just um, look at this with a, with a different perspective. So far, I focused on anxiety as one factor that leads to unethical behavior, correct? My goal here is to give you different examples of type of psychological factors that could lead people to engage in questionable behavior. And a lot of work I've done, if you look at it, they, they have parallels to what happens in real world, you know, in our real organizations. Anxiety is one factor when you look at work, People are under stress, there's a lot of anxiety. So anxiety, whether people are more likely to be honest or dishonest when they are anxious, is a very important practical and theoretical question. Another research project I've done is on time of day. So here the idea is that what happens when people are uh, you know, engaging in ethical decision-making in the morning or in the afternoon. So, in this study, what we did was that we basically ran a very similar study, similar to what I described earlier. But here, we were interested uh, to look at the effects of time of day. So <clears throat> what we did in the study was that we randomized um, people to either complete, half of them, to complete a task in the morning between 8 a.m. and noon, or the other half were asked to complete the same exact task in the afternoon from 2 to 6 p.m. 
And the reason we were interested in this was that obviously there are differences when you think about morning and afternoon. A lot of us, because when you think about our daily activities, we are going to be more tired, correct? Uh, more depleted and tired in the afternoon compared in the morning when we are fresh, we just woke up, we are more energized, we have more energy, and we aren't as tired. So in this study, what we find is that, again, remember, we simply randomize people to either complete the task in the morning or in the afternoon. And I'm just sharing with you one of the studies in this paper. We have um, you know, used different paradigms and replicated the same pattern with other type of tasks, other type of lying um, you know, a task. But what we find across a number of different studies and different paradigms is that people are more lucky to lie, to deceive others to earn more money in the afternoon compared in the morning. So this really shows evidence for people's inability to regulate their behavior and their inability to exert self-control in the afternoon to overcome temptation. So when people are tempted, either in the morning or in the afternoon, it's harder for them to resist temptation in the afternoon compared to the morning. So in this research, we are really showing that even something as simple as time of day um, can affect unethical behavior. Um, and the mere experience of our everyday activities can reduce our self-control and um, it could lead people to, to fall for temptation, to deceive others, to lie and cheat. So I, I'm not gonna go into much more detail about the empirics of this particular project paper. Um, once again, we, you know, it's, it's, it's a paper that we have published and we, we, we ran a number of different studies and we really show it's really you know, people being tired that's leading them to engage in morally questionable behavior in, in, in dishonest behavior. So, so far, what I have done is I hope that I was able to, to, to uh, give you examples, show you evidence that um, you know, there are um, a couple of, uh, many basically, many psychological uh, factors, social and psychological factors that could lead ordinary people to engage in questionable behavior, in dishonest behaviors. I gave you an example of who is the uh, like other people in your community that are cheating, whether it's in group or out group. I gave you an example of the time of day, correct? If it's in the morning or in the afternoon. Another example was anxiety, and there are many more examples when you think about uh, you know factors, psychological factors that lead people to to be dishonest. There are uh, studies I've done or other people in the field that they look at, for example, the type of goal, whether you have an ambitious, challenging goal. It's about business or competitive mindset. Research has shown, I've done some work showing that when people are in a business competitive mindset, then they are more likely to lie and deceive others. And there are studies on performance pressures. Again, studies have shown that when there is performance pr pressure, people are more likely to be dishonest and lie and, and cheat. And as you see, all of these studies are really leading to the same conclusion that there are psychological social factors that lead people to engage in questionable behavior. Now let me transition and talk a bit more about beyond this evidence for moral fallibility, what I'm calling really this idea that um, you know, almost any one of us, if you think about these factors, these studies are show, showing that these psychological social processes explain how ordinary people engage in everyday dishonest behavior, why we see like, um, you know, misconduct all around us. And these subtle social situational factors are impacting our, uh, you know, uh, moral behavior. But often another question we have is that a lot of times when it comes to dishonest behavior, it's not just one time behavior, correct? You see basically repeated dishonest behaviors when you think about people around us, the organization. So it's not just one time bad behavior, dishonest behavior, but many examples of misconduct that we can think of are repeated in nature, that you see this over and over playing. So, the question is, a lot of my research really focuses on why do individuals act unethically and even do so repeatedly. So that's why, you know, uh, you know, why everyday dishonest behavior happens over and over repeatedly. 
So let me um, give you one explanation. And my point here is that once again, my idea here is that I'm just giving you examples of research I've done and other like um, that really is showing this idea of more of fallibility and the idea that there are psychological mechanisms that lead us to, to engage in this repeated dishonest behavior while still feeling like we are good people. Because ultimately, as I said earlier, most people, we care deeply about being ethical good people. However, a lot of us are lucky to, to, to engage in questionable behavior, you know, to, to, to lie and deceive, to cheat a little bit, and still maintain this idea that we are good people. So I'm really providing evidence as how this happens, how in our mind, connect the psychology of our, ourselves, how is it possible that we engage in questionable behavior and even do so repeatedly and still maintain a positive self-concept, still maintain that we are good people, we are honest people. So one of the reasons, at least what our research is showing, again, this is one example. One of the things that we have shown in our research is that my research, we show that when people engage in unethical behavior, when they engage in dishonest behavior, they are more likely to forget that situation. That means that they are more likely to really like have a less clear memory of the situation. You know, what happened, how it happened, you know, how they felt and all that, the details of them, uh, you know, the, the situation. And here are, is like a couple of studies we did to, to really provide empirical support for, the, for this uh, phenomenon. Uh, we call this unethical amnesia. Again, people really obfuscating their memory, they forgetting the details of what they did. In one study, what we did was that we brought people in and when, then we randomized them and asked them to recall uh, something from their past. So there were five different groups of people. Some people we asked them, please remember a time when, where you did something questionable, unethical. Another, please remember a time when you did something ethical. Remember another group, remember something that you did that was a positive experience, another group negative experience, and some neutral experience. For example, when you, uh, you went grocery shopping or something like that. And then what we did was that after people um, write about this for about five minutes and give us some detail about what happened in that situation, when it was, and all that, then we asked them, um, you know, a questionnaire is a clarity of memory questionnaire. So we ask them, you know, uh, a question about the memory, like whether their memory is really detailed or is sketchy, do you really remember the event or not? And what we show in our study is that basically, when you ask people about, you know, their memory from their past behavior, you often see that unethical behavior people report that they have a less clear memory of their unethical behavior compared to other conditions. Whether it's a negative, for example, experience positive or even ethical or neutral. Of course, I understand the limitation of this study. We are relying on people's memory. The situations they are writing about, there is no control. People are writing about different examples. It's likely that because we don't want to really feel uncomfortable, we just remember things that are older I don't know, when I was really in a school, for example, compared to when we think about negative or positive, we are really recalling things that are more recent. So I completely understand that there are limitations to this data. So what we did next, another study is that now imagine this task. We brought in people to the lab. Again, we brought into the university to the lab. This time we asked them, they had to flip a coin and then, before they flip a coin, it was actually an electronic coin toss. They, they had it on their computer in the lab. We asked them, before you flip the coin, you have to predict whether it's going to be heads or tails. And then we, when they predicted whether it was heads or tails, then they would go ahead in a separate website, correct? Separate that we, don't ha we didn't uh, have access to. They think we didn't have access to. They would flip the coin, and then they come back to the to the our survey, and they would say, if their prediction matched the outcome, they would get one dollar, and it wasn't and it wasn't matched, then zero dollars. So people did this for ten rounds. So they flipped coin ten times, basically predicted the um, uh, you know an outcome, and then flipped the coin, and then reported for ten different flips. 
as you could imagine, obviously there is an opportunity to lie again, because here you are telling me head or tail, you do it in a separate website, then you come back to me and say whether it was head or tail and you earn money. So there is a chance that they could lie. And in our study, here is what we see on the, on the coin toss. There were 52% of these um, outcomes, flips, that the uh, prediction didn't match the, the outcome. As you, as you know, again, it's a fair coin. So 50% of the time, whatever they are predicting, their outcome should match that. And in our case, it does. Again, there were only 52, um, sorry, 48% of trials that you know, the outcome didn't match and there was an opportunity to cheat. Now, out of the 419 rounds that they could have cheated, so I took out like the trials that their prediction and the outcome was a match because they, they told us the truth and they were paid accordingly. So in the 419 rounds that they could have lied, we see that 46% of people, basically, they were honest. They didn't lie on any of these. However, about 44% of people lied about their outcome. So what they predicted didn't match the coin, but still they reported a match and they were able to earn money. And when we look at the numbers, we see that there are basically 45 individuals, about 56% that never lied. And there was 35% of people that lied at least once. And um, obviously people could lie multiple times because they did this for 10 rounds, correct? So no surprises whatsoever so far, because I already have shown you in prior studies that when there is an opportunity to lie, people are likely, not everyone obviously, but some people are lucky to lie to earn more money. And we show this data shows the same thing. But what we actually were interested in this study was their memory of what happened in the lab. So people came in, they completed this first part. They left. We asked them to come back to the lab in two weeks. They came back to the lab. This time we asked them um, you know, to complete a survey. And in the survey, we asked for their memory of what happened in two weeks earlier in the lab. So we asked them to report what they did in that study. We asked them how much they remember the details, the emotions they experienced and all that. And here, remember that people are really recalling same exact task two weeks earlier. So there is no difference in timeline. Everyone is recalling their um, performance two weeks earlier. But what we show here is that basically people have, people who cheated, we know who cheated, Corey, we had their um, performance data, so we know who cheated or not. What we show is that people who were honest, they reported a better memory. They had a better memory of the task um, two weeks earlier. People who cheated, they had a less clear memory. Their memory was a sketchier, basically more obfuscated. They didn't remember what happened two weeks earlier. In this study, I want to acknowledge that there are limitations. The, there was a self-selection, meaning that people had a choice to either lie or not. And when something like this happens, someone could say, oh, maybe these people who are cheaters, they just have a bad memory compared to other people. That's one way to think about this. Honest people have good memories, cheaters have bad memories, and that's it. But I want to really show that's not the case. It's the case that any one of us here, if we cheat, we are going to be less likely to remember it. That's my goal to convince you that's the case. And this is what we did. So in follow-up studies, we actually ran studies in which people were randomized to think about cheating or not, or actually cheat or not. So there was no self-selection that these are good or bad people, rather than you either are randomized to a condition that you could cheat or not, or recall something questionable in your past, and then we measure your memory. So for example, in one study we did was that we brought in people to the lab, and here we asked them to read a story, a detailed story. And in this story, they had to really take, it was a perspective taking task, role playing. So they have to read this story very carefully. And then at the end, respond a few questions. And then in a few days, come back and answer more questions about it. So in this study, these are college students. So what we did was that imagine that you have a test, it's, it's a chemistry test, you hate it. And then 
depending on the condition they were randomly assigned to, half of the people were assigned to a condition in which, again, this was a difficult task. We tell them it's chemistry, they don't like it. it like, um, uh, you know, they, they are, uh, you know, approaching an exam and they are really worried about like this exam. They feel like they, they have to study hard to really pass this exam. Half of the people, we told them that imagine that you made a cheat sheet as a backup, as a backup to, to, to cheat during exam. The other half day, we told them, imagine that you decided to hire a tutor to help you with this. Then we give them a like a detailed uh, you know, um, situation where, where they, they went ahead, they completed their exam. However, again, here there was another randomization. Some of the people, they read that the task was very difficult. They couldn't really answer the question. So they had to use their cheat sheet and cheat. Another group of people, they read that the task was very difficult, but they didn't use their cheat sheet because they could respond to the question. So they were honest. Another half, it was the tutor example that they did really well because they, whatever the tutor you know, taught them, uh, you know, that was useful. The other half, it was a negative condition, even though they had a tutor, they could, like they couldn't really respond to the question. So um, basically they, they, you know, they, they, they failed. And what we show again, people are reading one of these versions randomly. So they read only one version, correct? What we show is that basically right after people read this story, there is no difference between conditions. So you come in, you take the perspective of this college student. So these college students take the perspective of another person, again, going through this chemistry class and being confronted with an opportunity to cheat or not. And in half an hour, you see no difference in their memory, which is good. So basically, it's not the case that people had different memory when they or they engage with this scenario and this perspective taking task differently. However, what we show is that when in four days we bring these people back and we measure their memory in four days, now after four days, what you see is that people are less likely to remember people who were in the condition that they were told that, you know, they weren't able to solve this, they had to use their cheat sheet to cheat. Those people are the only group that they don't remember. They say, I don't remember what happened four days earlier. The rest of the group, they all look similar. Obviously, there is a drop that in four days, now it's you know, less clear memory, correct? Their memory is uh, obviously less clear because a few days have passed. But as you, you see in these graphs, you see this a significant drop in the unethical condition compared to the other three groups. So this provides evidence that when people do something questionable, they engage in unethical behavior, Immediately, there might not be any difference in their memory, but over time, we limit our uh, recollection, recall, correct? Relieving that situation, and we limit our memory, and we, you know, our memories become less clear. So obviously, so far, I only have shown that people's memory is worse. This is another study here. What we did was that we, we created a task in which half of the people had an opportunity to lie and be dishonest. There was a possibility to cheat and almost everyone cheated. Another half, there was no possibility of cheating. And here we are measuring their memory. Same, similar to the prior three studies that I discussed, you see lower memory for people who cheated compared to the other one that there was no opportunity to cheat. However, Another thing in this study is that we want to really provide evidence that people who have a less clear memory are the ones that are more likely to repeat this. That was the whole point of this, that some of the, one of the reasons why people are um, cheating over and over repeatedly is that we cheat, we do something questionable, we, we are dishonest, we forget about it, compared to other type of things that we do, we are more likely to forget the details of you know, our questionable behavior, dishonest behavior. And when we forget, we are likely to report, uh, basically repeat it uh, in time. And here, this study, what we show is that people who had a less clear memory of their questionable behavior, people who were dishonest and they couldn't remember, then subsequently, when we asked them to complete another task, in which they had an opportunity to lie to earn more money, 
those people with less clear memory were more likely to cheat again. So this is really providing evidence that on ethical amnesia, this idea that people are less likely um, to remember the details of their questionable behavior, the idea that people have a less clear memory of their past misdeeds and um, dishonest behavior, that's one of the psychological mechanisms that help us to engage in questionable behavior over and over. And this is one example I'm providing here. I've done other studies, other papers and projects where we look at other psychological mechanisms that's leading people to engage in questionable behavior. So my conclusion, basically, in the prior studies, you know, I showed you this evidence for moral fallibility, this idea that almost any one of us here there are psychological social factors that could lead us ordinary people to engage in repeated like in bad behavior and then the second project on memory really is showing that this moral fallibility we aren't perfect and there are psychological mechanisms that really again lead us to engage in questionable behavior, unethical behavior over and over. So my point here in this presentation was that really just really point out to this moral fallibility, this idea that uh, we aren't perfect and we are likely to make mistakes and, uh, and fail in being ethical and moral. And we have to think about it more carefully and come up with designs and systems that encourage people to learn from their lapses, their mistakes, and really focus on being good, honest people. So my like here is, you know, a lot of my research, what I do is that I then look at uh, systematic ways that we can correct for these biases, for this moral fallibility, how we can really help people to uh, stay true to themselves and engage in uh, honest behavior over and over. So in this talk, I want to just provide evidence for moral fallibility. And if you are interested, I've written about this have written about moral fallibility, and especially I have one um, article on uh, at HBR, Harvard Business Review, where I focus on how, uh, as individuals, we can take charge of our own behavior. And in that article, I write, um, um, you know, uh, about many different ways that we can really manage, be in charge of our own ethics, and engage in ethical behavior. So I really provide a roadmap of. Uh, what are the ways, systematic ways that we can really correct and don't fall for moral fallibility? Um, thank you. I think I, I'm almost, um, you know, uh, sort of on time with this. Uh, so I'm. I think we are going to have. Um, I don't know how many, but probably twenty minutes or more for Q and A. Thank you, everyone. It was. Um, uh, thank you for this opportunity. I'm very excited to 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 answer any questions. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Okay, hang on. Uh, let's see. Okay, uh, we have some great questions. And uh, thank you so much. It was so interesting. Uh, let me get right into it. Okay. So Tom asks, in the East, there's a concept and practice of proper adab that doesn't exist here in the West. Can you comment on that, please? Um, so I'm not familiar with it. So I'm to actually search and see what it is. I, I don't know if you can explain at least what he really means. So I know that like, uh, like I'm um, so Iranian, Persian. So I think if I'm understanding it correctly, he like at least in, in Farsi, we call it adapt, which means again, really proper behavior and manner and being appropriate, correct? Um, and good manners. So I feel like we, um, I want to push back a bit like that. I don't know if there is like something like that doesn't exist in this. Obviously, we all are taught about like good manners. We are all taught about like appropriate behavior um, and respect not as much. I agree that definitely there is a difference when you think about cross-cultural differences. There is a lot of evidence in psychology that like when you think about um, cross-cultural differences, like the idea of collectivism versus individualism, obviously when you think about is there's a higher emphasis on respect, especially respect to authority, respect to 
people who are older. But interestingly, research has shown that it's not easy to really say whether people in the East or West are going to be more ethical. Because when it comes to the psychology of it, you could imagine how people who are on the West, when they are deferring to authority, there is a bigger emphasis on respect and authority, they are actually more likely to follow um, unethical behavior that is really like when they are directed to engage in questionable behavior from their organization leaders or you know, broadly the society. So my point is that it's, it's not as simple as saying East or West, you see more or less questionable behavior. I think the mechanism, the psychological mechanism in play might be a bit slightly different. But certainly when I think about East, I think um, I can think of psychological mechanisms or processes that uh, unfortunately could lead to, to worse outcomes in East compared to West and vice versa. Okay. Um, Kathy asked, um, well, it's a comment and a question. So far, these studies are basically context and relationship free. But what if your mom was present, your nemesis, teammates? It's hard to think responses are so solely psychologically determined. Um, great question. And I don't want to give that impression that uh, when I say uh, psychological, again, it's just in a vacuum. Obviously, I generally said more of fallibility when you think about it, it's about psychological and social mechanisms. So I identified and highlighted that a lot of these are social, correct? I agree with you that the studies I presented here, they all were laboratory type of studies with very much control. And the reason I think that that was useful is that you see that even in a vacuum where like there is presumably no one else that would know about it, you are anonymous, you could just easily get $20 and walk, that, that's not something that happens. So there is a lot of psychology that, that is at play here. And um, what I want to add is that I've done a studies with an organizational context. So I, I've been fortunate enough. So, and what I would say in response is that a lot of the like psychological mechanisms you are talking, they are at play in the organizations. But obviously, organizational context and even our life broadly is more complex. There are multiple factors at play at any point in time. And my idea here was that to just like say under control condition, like really tease apart some of these factors um, and really show that, um, you know, these factors play a role. Uh, but in some of my other work, I actually look at organizational data. I do surveys, for example, I do surveys is of match supervisor and subordinate. Your super, super, supervisor, for example, leader reports your ethicality, good behavior, you know, and then you would report, for example, how anxious you are and things like that. So I, I, I'm a true believer in mixed methods and in my own research. Uh, I, today, I really focus on these laboratory studies so that these are a cleaner, um, basically, um, version. But um, we have seen similar effects uh, when it comes to organizations. Okay, so when people are not remembering their unethical behavior is, I, I mean, if I understand correctly, you're saying that they just have poor memories, but isn't it a little bit more complicated that they're suppressing, that they're rationalizing? Yes, but but they are rationalizing and suppressing again in more of a motivated way. So in one of our studies, I didn't talk about it here, is that we give them a quiz and if they respond to those, the quiz, which is about the details of the prior task, they actually earn more money. You still see the same thing. Even though right now, if I do better on this quiz, which is if like a memory of what I did before the details, I earn more money. We still see that people aren't performing as well. So again, it's motivated. You are very like you are right. The, the mechanism here is that it's a motivated forgetting mechanism. And if you look at the cognitive psychology and psychology literature broadly, this is a phenomenon that happens, correct? We heard a lot about trauma, how people like, um, you know, um, uh, they, they limit their access to their memory. So my idea is that this happens even for our everyday uh, dishonest behavior. It doesn't have to be a trauma or something like that. We are very motivated to forget. We want to see ourselves as good people. And for that reason, even really, um, details of like our everyday experiences when we, we were dishonest, uh, we, we could just like uh, uh, suppress that memory. And I think okay. that, that's the point. Um, we have so many good questions here. Okay, Richard asks, when I hear about laboratory experiments involving rewards, the rewards are always trivial, a 
few dollars, who cares? What is, why is this a good measure of what happens outside the laboratory when the potential <laughs> rewards for unethical behavior are thousands and millions of dollars rather than pocket change? This is great. I think great question. Yes, think about it. Let's imagine you could lie and earn 10 bucks versus millions. Yes, you could imagine there are gonna be more people motivated to do that. But at the same time, often when you are lying for millions of dollars, you're harming a larger group of people. So I guess psychologically, it's even harder to sometimes to lie for millions. So my point here is that it's not a simple story that the amount, like the, the, the amount of incentives, correct? Whether it's a, I don't know, $10 versus a million is a strong predictor of what people do. That's not, and there are studies, I, I have colleagues that have done studies where, for example, in my study, I use $20. There are people who've done these studies, $20 versus $200. Obviously a significant amount of time if you're just coming to the lab for 10 minutes. And even in those studies, you still see there are few people I'd say 10% of people that just do like cheat to the maximum amount, especially if it's a large bonus, most people, they don't do it because it's even harder for us to justify when we lie for a lot of money. It's easier for us to say, oh, you know, I just like no big deal. It was just five bucks. When it's about hundred dollars, 200, a million, again, psychologically, it's even harder to justify. So my point is that it's not a simple econ perspective. You like the incentives are higher, Almost everyone or most people are going to lie. Actually, that's not the case. Okay. Um, another question. In the left-right trials, there appeared to be no potential penalty for lying and the very trivial amounts of money involved. Why is this a predictor of real-world behavior other than encouraging companies not, <laughs> not to use anxiety-producing music? <laughs> so great. Again, um, the studies I presented, and I think the, this is quite important that I was very selective. As I told you, for example, for the anxiety project or paper that's published, we have other data from actual organization where people are reporting their stress and anxiety and we link it to actual dishonest behavior, misreports in the organization. So my point is that I was just giving you clean studies. Those are correlational studies where you actually show the same phenomenon. People who report they are anxious and they are under stress, you see that those are the people that are more likely to lie to their boss and they, they there are most uh, more misconduct so um your point well taken we combine these set of studies because when it's correlational you you don't know what's really happening there are a lot of other things that like because someone is anxious there could be other things these studies when you complement you have better evidence okay this actually goes into the next question how do you design a, a environment to reduce the probability of cheating? Great point. I think it's, um, I've been thinking and writing a lot about this. And I think one of the things that I talk, um, you know, I've done other talks about it is that how we can create an organization that has a learning approach towards ethics. Meaning that I think when we think about our life, personal and professional life, our goal is to become better people. And actually workplace is one place that we spend most of our time. And if organizations are willing to design systems in which they encourage good behavior, especially in long run, there are incentives for people to engage in good behavior. And if they are failing, if there are any, if there is any moral lapse, they get the right amount of feedback, constructive developmental feedback that they can learn and grow. I think that's something that we, we would help us to really, you know, a bit, like create better organizations. So again, I've written about that extensively in my work. Um, and I definitely like anyone who's interested, I have another Harvard Business Review article that is ca called how to build an ethical um, company. So I think I've written about that separately. Okay. Um, okay, so another good question. Um, how do you explain people like Trump and Putin who seem to lie and cheat repeatedly without any remorse and without any penalties? <laughs> yes. So let me give you, again, I've been like doing this type of research now for about 15 years, okay? The, the way I see it, I, I started this, this conversation talking about, you know, there are, uh, you know, these different, um, like, sort of ways we look at people. Is it really contextual? Only organization is bad. So people are just bad when they are in this organization. Later, there are going to be good people or there are a few bad apples. 
generally most people that's not the case however there is a lot of evidence in psychology like devil like when you look at is that there are few people like a good i don't know but i'd say about five to ten percent of people that are narcissistic whatever liars so and again so like but they're sociopaths, frankly. And there's evidence that those people exist. So my point is that I was trying to explain everyday behavior by most of us, hopefully not the five or 10% that are sociopaths. And then I have to be honest, Frank, there are gonna be five or 10% of people that are saints that no matter what you do, they're gonna really be honest, ethical all the time. But most of us, probably 70, 80% or whatever, 50 to 80% are in between. That depending on the context, social forces, they are gonna be honest or dishonest. And I think that was what I was trying to explain. Hopefully that I, we don't want to put those people, narcissists and sociopaths in power. Unfortunately, some of them are in power. Uh, can you talk about uh, a little bit about differences in behavior based on gender, age, religious and cultural identities? Um, great question. I think there's a lot of research that has looked at it um, generally. Again, I don't, I don't want to overgeneralize it, obviously, um, because again, I think this is just the wrong way to think about some one gender or one race is better or worse. I think I don't really I believe in that. But on average, what research empirical evidence so far has shown, um, most of it really correlational, really reports from organization. I don't think we see this consistently in lab studies that often women are uh, more honest. I don't think there is much of a, a difference in culture, frankly. In terms of uh, religiosity, there is mixed evidence. Depending on the type of task, you would see that more, um, you know, less uh, dishonest behavior. Especially, I would say for religiosity, one predictor is whether your religion is salient, primed or not. So often religiosity is not primed and it's not salient in the context, you don't really see much of a difference. But when it's salient, let's say you, you see a cross or something, it's, people are often more honest. Okay. Um, have you, uh, can you talk about any research um, where people, with the risk of um, unethical behavior involves physical harm to another person? Um, not as much. I think like, like we have had, I have had studies where we look at like um, misconduct and some of the reports are like harm. I think physical harm isn't as much, at least in my research. I know other people who do it, but not me. I personally haven't looked at physical harm. You know, there's that famous experiment with the, the buzzer. Um, oh yeah. And-, and uh, I think that is study, uh, basically, um, the, the one that you are referring, I think they basically use shocks. And I think it's all about, you know, authority, like whether like the experiment that tells you, and I think the whole idea was that when someone in power is asking you, like, like surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly, like people are following it. And I think I, that was what I was referring when I said about culture, East and West, and, uh, you know, difference to authority and loyalty. I think those are all important factors. I haven't done anything physical myself. Um, uh, hang on one second. Let's see. Um, can you control for upbringing the parental influences of honesty and dishonesty? Um, I think there are, there are, uh, I'm not a um, developmental psychologist, but I know I have friends, colleagues that are, they look at morality and like, uh, for example, deception, lying and things like that uh, among kids and the norms. Uh, obviously, we all know that like the, uh, kids learn about these from the age of two and onward really like, um, so there is very like fascinating research, uh, you know, I'm aware of that they look at kids. What I'd say is that what research in psychology generally has shown is that our character, even though obviously we have a lot of like, it's influenced in large, you know, in early years by parents and like, you know, the family and like friends, and it's not really fixed. Often you see a lot of like, you know, changes over, over people's life. And I think that's the reason I, I'm calling for organization to really have a learning attitude or approach that it's not like because you know, have someone 18, 20 or 30 in your organization, their character is all set. There's a lot going on that you have control over and you could help them still even at that age to really learn and grow and become better people. So my point is that yes, there is obviously an effect of uh, upbringing, 
there are a lot of interesting twin studies, for example, whatever one twin is in this context, another other. So we, sh we see some evidence of upbringing, but it's not as strong as we think. So it's, there's a lot of room for, for the context we are in to impact our ethicality. Okay. Um, so you work at the business school and the business school is training future business leaders. There's also a very extensive um, uh, executive education program. So people who are already given the power within their organizations to lead others. Do you talk to them about this? Yes, so I think in our MBA programs, I did a full-time uh, MBA, part-time programs. We have speaking and even executive. We have classes on ethics and leadership we talk about. And I think um, fortunately for the, for the past decade or so, I say. So before, the, like these classes, a lot of them were more just philosophy and normative ethics. I think more recently, you see a lot more behavioral studies and the type of things I discuss here to be really a part of those discussions so that people really have a better understanding of what's happening and how they feel what they do and how they are leading others. So I think we are trying. I think I'm 100% sh I'm sure we could do better, frankly. Uh, I don't think that we, uh, we do enough. And my that's the reason I feel like I, I, I'm passionate about this topic. I, I write and talk and all that because I feel like there is a still a, a huge opportunity for us, especially in business schools, um, to, to make sure that we, we train people and we, we equip them with, with, with skills that would be helpful for them as, as they uh, work in organizations. It's, I, I mean, I think it's endemic in the corporate world, uh, certainly within politics, we see that. But yeah. um, I've, you know, I've been in corporate organizations, and there are people, I remember one person I worked for who was just cruel, horrible, but she got results, and people look the other way. And and as you said, I think that's the, that's the reason that I think I, I mentioned earlier, I have done a project that looks at calculative business mindset and definitely is a strong predictor of unethical behavior. Like when people are in that mindset, they do it. But as you are saying, if we encourage that mindset and it's not really a focus on, on good behavior, like it's, it's just very tough for people. So I think I'm sure she had a huge impact on people who she was working with, correct? And I think that that's, unfortunate. My hope is that we have a commitment from the organizational leaders that to really stay true to, to moral values. My point is that, you know, not, I knew that we could not affect her behavior per se, but it was disappointing that the people she reported to looked the other way. That, yeah. that was the failure, I thought. I agree. And as I said, as an organization, you if you put business over like um, you know um, the values you 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 care about, hopefully there are values. Correct. A lot of organizations, if you, you look at, they 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 all have visions and and they, they all talk about like really you know how you know their values. So I think uh, as you said, I think that's the point. I completely agree that it's not just one person. There could be bad people, but it's a system. An organization have to manage these systems. And I think part of it is making it psychologically safe so people could talk about these issues, could report it, and then think about that things are going to be different if they if they, they talk about it, correct? So there is this idea of efficacy. If there is a question of a person, I could give them feedback, but if nothing is going to change, obviously, like it's no one is going to really be motivated to do so. I think it's a system, and I think that's our goal to really take more systematic approach towards this. Um, have you written at all about the um, unethicality in uh, the Purdue Pharmacology, um, you know, with yeah. the oxycotton, and because that yeah. that was a clear exhibit of example of um, the corporate the corporate structure encouraged the unethicality. I think unfortunately when you look at like um, the reports of misconduct and the scandals, unfortunately there are a lot of them. And interestingly, 
like there are different like you see that top level middle bottom like different type of industry so unfortunate and that's the reason i think the work we are doing when we look at more deeply about individuals the the, the social process that are happening at group level and organization level um, I think that's quite important because these could translate to any type of organization and industry. Uh, but unfortunately, there are um, many cases. And I think that like our goal is to, to, to study these and hopefully learn from them to be able to like really um, not fall for them again. Absolutely. Um, in your research, the examples you presented were all very clear cut. You know, there were either the number of dots on the left and the number of dots on the right. But what about you know, in our culture today, even truth is kind of amorphous. And uh, you know, I remember when Kellyanne Conway said on live TV, well, alternative facts. I mean, what kind of situation is that? So how do you how do you navigate that? So this is a great point. I think in my studies, I use a combination of the two, meaning that there are scenarios I give people or like when they are making a decision or task that is more ambiguous. Even in DOT, I told, showed you that half of the trials, it was ambiguous. There was no right or left. And my point is that in those type of situation, the motivated processes, when we think about our psychology, because of the motivated reasoning and processes, you see that people are going to really see truth, whatever benefits them. But in my studies are showing that even in clear cases, when it's like more clear is cheating, really. Again, more of a truth, you see same phenomenon. So my point is that I completely agree. When it's more ambiguous, it's even harder. You see even more selfish, self-interested and motivated behaviors. But those even happen when it's really obviously, you know, dishonest behavior. Like really clearly there are more dots or people are really whatever, very clearly you are lying to harm someone to get more money. So you see the same phenomenon and even like obviously amplified when it's ambiguous, unfortunately. So the point is that we try to go with more clear cuts. So really it's just, again, makes a point, but that means that we see these like more pronounced when it comes to ambiguous situations, unfortunately. When do children form consciences? Oh, good question. Um, I think it's like, close to two years, but then moral, I think it's a bit later. But I think there are studies really looking at, um, you know, uh, I think, for example, like when it comes to moral, I think there, there, we have to understand there are different more, more many, you know, moral, like for that fairness, I think is one of the earliest one, for example, for example, they develop. I think lying and dishonesty is later than fairness. Um, so I think it depends on uh, what type of value we are talking about as well. Okay. Um, last questions. Um, someone wanted to know, um, are business people more prone to unethical behavior? <laughs> um, there is evidence showing that, like, um, I, as I said, business mindset, the context, the culture, like that focus on bottom line and performance and cost benefit analysis leads to more dishonest behavior. So- Do do public corporations show more unethicality or less because you have shareholders that you need to deliver for? Um, I think probably depends on honesty because it's all about like um, dishonest behavior, uh, transgressions, violations that are obviously like public companies, there is more transparency. And again, generally transparency leads to you know, lower unethicality because it's just more transparent, but that that's not the key. like it's not a clear cut. Again, it, it's it's a lot more about what type of violation we are talking about. For example, right now I gave you really these biggest scandals. When you think about violations, let's say environmental violations, HR violations, it's just countless. Just look at the data. It's just unfortunate what, what we see out there. And I think a lot of companies, big or small public or private, even nonprofit, unfortunately, you see a lot of different transgressions and violations. So, um, but our goal is to, again, come up with systems that either pro for profits, nonprofits, like, um, you know, uh, they could adopt. I think it's like, again, really thinking more, um, you know, systematic about these and thinking about human behavior and behavior of individuals within groups. I think that's the reason I, I see a lot of value in this because I think these are things that we could translate in different contexts and use them. 
Thank you. This was so interesting. Thank it was, it was it. just so interesting. Um, you mentioned uh, different um, Harvard Business Review articles. I am going to try and look for links to those articles um, online that are free. Um, if I can't, I'm going to follow up with you to see maybe we can get one or two of them to attach, um, you know, to send as um, a follow up um, to people because I think they'd be interested sure. in reading them. Uh, well, the good you. thing, the good thing about your topic is you have lots of research possibilities. <laughs> yes. There's no shortage of uh, information. Yes. Thank you so much. This was so interesting. I hope you had a good time um, speaking to our group. Yes, um, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. It was really lovely to, 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 to be able I, to. Yes. I told you it's a smart group. They'd come up with great questions. Yes, definitely, yes, not... great questions. So um, folks, thank you again for, um, for coming and listening to Marianne. In two weeks, our friend, Dr. Jeffrey um, Arba will be back to talk about intimacy during COVID. So that should be an interesting talk as well. Thanks Thank so you much. again, Levy Senior Center Foundation. We will see you in two weeks. Thanks. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.